All right, what are we talking about today? What what's on the uh, what's on the menu for today? <laughs> the bar menu. What's the <laughs> the bar? What's yeah. The, what the happy hour specials? The, yeah, we got cold right. chicken wings and what else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and insults. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, they serve that every day. <laughs> wait a minute, I feel like I can get that anytime. <laughs> That's right. Hey everyone, it's Elliot and Todd. Welcome to Two Designers Walk Into a Bar, an ongoing conversation about pop culture and iconic design. In our new season, we're stepping back in time and into a neighborhood watering hole to rub elbows with Gen X as their coming of age, drinking age. We could be lounging at a dive in Seattle or maybe checking in at a combo bar slash cyber cafe down the coast in San Francisco. Wherever we find ourselves, we'll be here until the band starts passing the hat or we're kicked out for freeloading. <laughs> So ask the bartender for a slightly cool Olympia and see if they have any slightly warm pizza rolls. And pull up a seat between us and the flannel-clad regulars here in the bar. Okay, so Todd, we're back in the bar again, and uh, this is the last of our Gen X episodes. We've had fun here. We've talked about the origins of Gen X. We've talked yes. about advertising Gen X. We've talked about some of the music and, and albums that Gen X enjoyed. Uh, so really, all of these things, you had to place ads somewhere. You had to learn about music somewhere. So let's yeah. talk about magazines. Let's All talk right, about good. what people were reading about. Um, I love magazines. You do? Okay. I do, yeah. Even now, even as we sit here. I know, yeah. With the yeah. interwebs and everything. Publishers Clearinghouse loves me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're keeping them afloat. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I am the one. I'm the one, yeah. So as we jump in, I want to note that we have brought some magazines with us to the bar today, but this list yep. is by no means comprehensive, right? Okay. So there were right. a lot of great and greatly influential magazines being produced during this time, the 80s and 90s. Some of them we've talked about in past episodes, right? Interview right, we right. talked about yeah. with Andy Warhol. Colors we talked about. Um, we were talking about Benetton. Yeah. Entertainment Weekly was another one that's... Uh, kind of in some form still hobbling along. I think it became Entertainment mm -hmm. Monthly, and now it's Entertainment Whatever. Um, <laughs> entertainment <laughs> Decadely. <laughs> yeah. Entertainment. Oh, we have to put a new issue out? Uh, yeah. <laughs> along with uh, countless zines, alternative magazines like Mondo 2000, Might, and I know this is one of your favorites, Todd, Blah, Blah, Blah. <laughs> oh, I love Blah, Blah, Blah. I think yes. Blah, Blah, yeah. Blah may have lasted like three issues or something like that. <laughs> as as um, you would expect. Yeah, yeah we, and that was probably three more issues than it needed to last, right? Since this is a design and pop culture podcast, I'm going to frame each of the following magazines around when their most iconic art directors were part of the mastheads, because otherwise we'd just be right. boiling the ocean, right? Oh, yeah, totally, because there's plenty around. There's plenty of ocean there to boil. So, <laughs> Aren't there six <laughs> oceans, six or seven oceans? But that's a lot of oceans. There, Have you tried there's, to boil there's, a there's, single ocean? There's Frank Ocean. There's Billy Ocean. Billy I mean, this ocean, list just keeps yeah. going. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's set some criteria here. So why these magazines and why these designers? Why are we going to talk about these folks today? Okay, I give up. <laughs> you're supposed to be in on this. We're supposed to Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, well, <laughs> oh, right. if, if you're giving up this early in the game, I mean, that doesn't bode well for the rest of the episode. <laughs> you're like, I'm gathering up my magazines and I'm leaving. I'm excited <laughs> to hear these three reasons myself. <laughs> okay, so first one, the work popped off the rack. Right? You had to, if oh, you're in the supermarket, in the bookstore, wherever you were when you saw these things, you had to want to pick it up. So I think yeah. that's table yeah. stakes, right? And right. then the work won awards for being unique and true to the material that it mm -hmm. was talking about, right? And the audience it was trying to connect to. Mm -hmm. And then I think the third reason is because this work 
spawned countless imitators, and some were definitely more successful than others. So, Todd, are you still excited now that you know the three reasons? I am, and I bet I can guess at least one of the ones you want to talk about. Uh, yeah, you and I have known each other a while, so I'm sure. Oh, yeah, I know. Sure. How much all, you right, know. all right, all right, all yeah. right. So, without any further ado, let's jump in with a few of my favorites, all of which were very influential for me as a young designer. I might have one more do, though. Oh, okay. Well, la no more, okay, You thought we were. <laughs> well, look. No, I'm, okay. There is no, there is no further ados now. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm done with them. Oh boy! I mean, yeah, we also have no no further listeners, but that's besides yeah. the point. Let's let's we'll soldier on. We'll edit this on. part out. Oh, we'll yeah. edit this yeah. part out. Yeah, we, this is going to be a tight uh, <laughs> tight five minute episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you think you're clairvoyant? You think you know me? Oh yeah. Guess what the first magazine is then? Hot shot. Ray Gun, David Carson oh, era. Never mind. Yeah, you Is guessed it. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could, you could. I mean, you could have. You like knowing you, you would have fooled me. You're like, no, Wired, man. Nah. <laughs> no, yeah. it was uh, good housekeeping. Okay, it yeah. was good house. Ha- yeah, <laughs> you good. love Ray Gun. I do. I I love Ray Gun, Garden and Gun. <laughs> any any magazine with gun in the title, <laughs> like I'm I'm all at guns and ammo. <laughs> those are really guns and those, guns. Those are those are my big three. Okay, <laughs> so for those of you who may have never picked up an issue of Ray Gun or may have sort of only heard of it, may or may not even know who David Carson is. Let's frame this a little bit because we do have a lot of listeners who, of course, are mm-hmm, not designers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So David Carson is a graphic designer, art director, former pro surfer, best known for his quote unquote experimental typography and a lack of use of grids in his layout. So again, for those of you who have really never uh, laid anything out and may not know what that means, it's basically just a way to order things on a page, uh, helping with scale and proportion and things like that. So just when we talk about a grid, Mm -hmm. that's what we mean essentially. So Carson first made his mark with Beach Culture, which was this magazine that was published quarterly in 1989. So <laughs> talking about, as we were a minute ago, Todd, limited uh, run magazines, maybe that weren't intended to be limited run, but ended up right, being right. limited run. Beach Culture is one of these. So it only published six issues. Now, okay, that's fine. But there's a pretty good issue to design award ratio here, if we're talking about influence. So folds after only they six won a lot. issues. How many did it win? 150 more than 150 design awards damn so yeah yeah so obviously it was impactful okay so he starts to make his mark his can i go ahead and use this word can i say beachhead in the industry yeah Uh, yeah okay i see what you did there yeah everyone's everyone's like yeah hold on listen you can hear (laughs) listen that's listen to all those eye rolls (laughs) that's right listen to all the all the all the pauses happening right now um (laughs) So then he goes on and he works for Surfer Magazine. Again, makes a lot of sense, right, since he was a pro surfer. But his big break came when he took on the role of art director for Ray Gun. And Ray Gun, (laughs) this is great. So this is a magazine that just drops out of the blue, right? And so they their own tagline. This is what they call themselves. I love this. The Bible of music and style. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So great. No hubris uh, there. Yeah, none. None. Totally humble. So this is 1992. It was spun up by a guy named Marvin Scott Jarrett. Um, So he was the one publishing it. And so David Carson's widely considered to be the father of the quote unquote grunge typography era. Mm. And this Mm. magazine was his blank canvas. So Todd, Gen X, grunge, this is the, the connection, right? There you go. And he was an artist as well, too. And he also, he broke and worked with some amazing photographers and illustrators that mm-hmm. were a little bit outside the mainstream. Mm-hmm. Some of whom you love and, and also some of whom we know, right? So yeah. former schoolmate of yours and former boss of mine, Hayes Henderson, had uh, mm-hmm. uh, an illustration in an early ray gun. And then one of your mm-hmm. favorite artists, Matt Mahurin. Uh yeah. I know you love yeah. Matt Mahurin. He had work in... Uh, uh, or, you know, some of the early issues of Ray Gun. So um, Carson's work features a dynamic relationship between words and pictures. And uh, he admits that it's self-indulgent. Um, but his distinctive style comes from his choice to make the work personal and subjective. And so there was, again, with this lack of grid, there's this lack of visual hierarchy. And so it was really this visual feast. So it sort of had this feeling of controlled chaos. And uh it really 
reflected the vibe of what was going on culturally at the time with music and movies and mm -hmm, celebrity mm -hmm. culture and I, I guess music and style, if you think about the tagline, right? So the look of youth culture, postmodernism movement of the 90s, and he utilized these boutique type houses that were breaking the rules with their offerings, often pushing legibility. So this was really when digital uh, fonts were really starting to come into their own. And this is, again, baby internet. So you could maybe learn about them, but you know, you'd have to buy them on CD or floppy disk. But a lot of these folks would oh, give right, them to uh, right. David Carson for free so that they could brag and say, just like the artists we were talking about, they could say, yeah, come check out this font. It's in Ray uh -huh. Gun, right? Yeah, so speaking of breaking the rules and pushing legibility, didn't he once set an entire article in Zaff Dingbats? <laughs> yeah, he became pretty famous or infamous for that, depending on <laughs> <laughs> who you talk to. So it was an article on Roxy Music, and he, he said he read the article, and he was like, this article sucks. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. he's like, this is how I'm going to make it interesting. <laughs> so he sets it all in icons, and the writer apparently was really not happy. What was great was the publisher didn't seem to care, right, because they printed it. Um, yeah. But what ended up happening, if I remember correctly, is in the following issue, they actually, because this is again pre-internet, you couldn't just toss it online, they uh, printed the, the story in full, sort of as an apology to both Roxy Music and the writer. The, <laughs> uh, the plain old bougie way of publishing yeah, yeah, and, and, uh, uh, articles. Roman yeah. characters, I know. Like blah, 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 <laughs> words. The blah, nerve, blah, the blah, nerve blah. Of, the of, of the guy. Um, so now, there's this mythology that Carson is self-taught. And uh, <clears throat> I hate to be the bearer of bad news, uh, designers who listen, this isn't entirely true. Um, mm. So does he have a degree in design? No, he has a, a degree from San Diego State in sociology. <laughs> However, uh, did he take some design classes uh, after he found himself in Basel, Switzerland? <laughs> yes, yes, he did. Oh, okay, yeah. so he kind of he kind of went to the to the fountain there. He went to the main source of design, didn't he? Yeah, and I think this is really ironic because, of course, if you are a student of design, you know that the Swiss, if you want to talk about grid structure, the Swiss are really the ones who are very rigid about this, and so. The only thing I can think is maybe in some intuitive way he had to gravitate toward uh, understanding what the rules were so he could exploit that and just blow them all up, right? Mm, yeah, it makes sense. It's rare to speak to a designer who's into zines, music, and generally a less strict aesthetic, visual aesthetic, and not have them cite Carson as an influence. So. Todd, if you remember the organization American Center for Design, they exalted him as having made, quote, the most important work coming out of America, unquote. Wow. Yeah, while Creative Review called him, quote, the art director of an era, unquote. Oh, okay. uh, and then in 2014, he was awarded the AIGA uh, gold medal. Um, wow. So... I remember when he was profiled in Newsweek, and that was really exciting for me because to me, that was that sort of design I love going really mainstream, going outside of design circles uh -huh. and, and going uh -huh. into the general public. I, and again, we talked about when Life Magazine published Jackson Pollock and how that got right, his right, work right, right. In, the, in the mainstream. So this is that same idea, I think, for design. So that was super exciting for me. And so I actually wrote a letter uh, to the editors of Newsweek, actually, it might have been an email by this point, about the article. And then that article also ended up getting into Newsweek. So, um, <clears throat> Todd, I, I hate to, uh, you know, push my resume in your face, my bona fides, uh -huh, uh -huh, but uh, uh -huh. yeah, David Carson and I have both been in uh, Newsweek. Wow. So that that makes you editorially famous, kind of, doesn't it? Tallest midget, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Hey, take it. Take what you can get. <laughs> That's right. So uh, Carson has an irreverent approach and made his name by ignoring the rules, right? So we talked about breaking the grids. And he actually said, use your eyes, not the rules. <laughs> so I don't know if he meant like rules as in straight lines <laughs> or what mm -hmm. he, or yeah, does right, he, right. oh, he's breaking all kinds of rules. So or rulers. Uh, yeah, yeah. So here's something interesting. So I was actually unknowingly introduced to David Carson's design work. So 
as I've mentioned in past episodes, and Todd, as, as you and I have talked about before, um, I grew up skateboarding, and when I was in high school, one of the magazines I subscribed to was Trans World Skateboarding. And mm-hmm, actually, mm-hmm. at the time, he was art directing that magazine. And I remember oh, okay. thinking there was something special about it, and it just felt different than not only magazines like Newsweek, but... Um, also, their rival magazine, their rival skateboard magazine, which was called Thrasher. Um, uh-huh, uh-huh. And now he's doing more with collage. Um, so if you look at his website or if you follow him on LinkedIn or anything like that or look at some of his, he's doing classes as well, online classes. Um, he's doing more with collage. And, and since I do collage in my free time as well, I'm, I'm really into that. Um, yeah, so there's another thing the two of you have in common then. Yeah, so maybe. You can. We could be when you pen get together. Pals. Yeah, we could be collage. Yeah, yeah pen when pals. you can talk about your your presence in Newsweek and making um, collages. Yeah, I'm going to bring some of my work and I'll I'll sign it for him. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> that that's I mean, a really good idea. Yeah, I, I think I, he'd I, like that. Yeah, I, I always always have it in the trunk of my car in case you know I'm getting gas somewhere and I'm like, oh, it's David Carson. <laughs> hey, can I tell you about a new business opportunity? <laughs> in my collages. That's right. You like old stuff, you know, smashed on a page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that one is a real given. That that one, like you nailed that one. Like uh-huh. Ray Gun, if you think of that era, the grunge era, nailed it. Right? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, hundred percent. What others were top of mind for you? Okay, so when we were talking about the origins of Gen X, we were talking about personal tech and how tech was becoming more scaled down around individuals. And naturally, of course, that meant that it was going to start to have an impact on people's lives. So, Todd, have you ever heard of a a little magazine out of San Francisco named uh, named Wired? Does that ring a bell? Wired. What? How was it spelled again? Uh, I think it was mainly geared toward the Amish, which is why you may not have uh, heard of it. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I think it does sound, yes, wired, yes. I think I, re- I recall that. Okay, so let's talk about the origin story of Wired a little bit, because that has to do with the first art directors that really helped shape the look and feel of the magazine. So this mm, would be mm-hmm. in the uh, Plunkett and Kerr era, so the origin of Wired in the mid-90s. So let's jump in here for a minute. So most people have heard about Wired, of course, but probably, again, you heard about it when it was bought by Condé Nast and kind of went national, international when Uh, they scaled uh it up. And it really is sort of a pale imitation today in terms of what it was originally at the time. So it premiered in January of 1993, inviting readers to a future where, in a few years' time, personal computers, the internet, and cell phones would become commonplace. So, thinking about that in terms of today's network world, of course. Mm-hmm. So, get mm-hmm. this, though. It predated the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web was mentioned in issue three of Wired. <laughs> I'm not mm-hmm. sure uh, if it predated the AOL uh, member floppy disk or not. <laughs> we'll have to go back <laughs> and research that. So... Uh, Uh, There were tons of those. Um, And Wired sort of watered down today, as I mentioned, from what it was 30 years ago. So back then it was bigger. It was thicker. It had fluorescent inks, metallics. It even had this stuff on the blow-in subscription cards. I always remembered when those fell out of a magazine, you never forgot if it was a Wired magazine because it was always glowing and and reflective. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. So, okay, do you want to just quickly tell uh, our listeners what a blow-in subscription card is? Yeah, so um, if you pick up a magazine, there's usually cards that are... <laughs> if you can find them. Yeah, yeah, if you, if you cast your mind back to go in a vintage store and find a magazine. No, I think a lot of people still get printed magazines of some sort. Basically, it's the little cards that would fall out, the postage paid cards that would, um, you know, you would sign up for a subscription with now obviously today it's very easy to do online as well but there are some people who will still send these cards back i literally open a magazine i subscribe to today and the cards tumbled out which that's something that's always frustrated me i'm like i'm already a subscriber you don't have to give me those cards (laughs) save the planet (laughs) yeah right 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 there you go So there were also these illustrated quotes that kicked off each issue, sort of theming the issue. And these were true works of art that span multiple pages. Um, The other thing I want to do, and uh, this was sort of their uh, blow-in cards writ large, when Wired went public and issued Mm -hmm. stock, 
the stock mm -hmm. certificate was sexy as hell. Like it won all kinds of design awards because it was really? also printed with metallics and uh -huh. <laughs> fluorescent inks. And it was awesome because it was a legal document. They wanted to make it hard to, to counterfeit. Um, right, you know, so if you right. think about some of the things we've talked about with money, you know, you've mentioned some of the things they do to prevent counterfeiting with money. Um, yeah. They were doing all kinds of funky stuff with uh, with these stock certificates. So I'll find that and I'll add that to our episode page. Cool. Yeah. Well, good on them for taking something that um, had a utilitarian purpose and uh, and really kind of stepping it up and making it glow a little bit. Yeah. So, like I said, credit goes to John Plunkett and Barbara Kerr. And they're a husband and wife uh, design team. Plunkett went to CalArts and had a history of working with some very prestigious firms, um, including Pentagram. And he crossed paths with editor and publisher Louis Rossetto when they were both living in Paris in the mid 80s. Oh, bonsoir. <laughs> Enchanté. <laughs> Enchanté. We're wrong. Oui, oui. Uh, we, we are so beloved by all our French listeners. This is only yeah, going to yeah. <laughs> uh, make them send us. Further endearing. Yeah, them. yeah. Yes, Champagne yes. and baguettes are on the way. What's interesting, so you think about, okay, well, West Coast, cutting edge, cyber stuff. But Plunkett and Kerr weren't even in San Francisco. They weren't even in California. They were really? actually in Park City, Utah. Oh, wow. Which today you're like, eh, you know, no big deal. But of course, 30 years ago, if the World Wide Web didn't even debut until issue three, uh -huh. that was a little bit of a harder slog, right? So designing remotely mm. was pretty revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, it's hard to think about now, but Wired really was on the bleeding edge. Tech and lifestyle blended together in one magazine, right? You historically had tech magazines like Omni or Popular Science, and then you had lifestyle mm -hmm. magazines that, um, you know, were more fashion-driven or whatever. And this was really pulling it together in a single magazine. And in the beginning, advertisers really couldn't understand it. So when they were being asked yeah. to advertise in this thing, they're like, well, who is this for? You know, interesting. Yeah, that I could imagine and just... Uh... Ironically, I'm um, I'm rereading uh, Ed Catmull's book Creativity Inc., yeah, which yeah. is all about blending creative and technology, and very similar to what you just said here. And uh, it's a unique blend uh, when it works well. So I can imagine that at first people hadn't seen anything like that. Yeah, it's great that you bring up Pixar because this was when baby Pixar was kind of really working. This is yeah, when yeah. they were pulling away from um, Industrial Light and Magic and becoming their yeah. own thing. And I'm sure in 93, I mean, I've read Creativity Inc. as well, but 93 was when they were really in earnest starting on Toy Story yeah. and, and other yeah. movies, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from its beginning uh, for Wired, the strongest influence on the magazine's editorial outlook came from Rosetto, the publisher. So in 1999, he and Plunkett created a 12-page manifesto for a new magazine, and nearly all of the ideas in it were realized in the magazine's first several issues. And during the five years of Rosetto's editorship, Wired's colophon credited Canadian media theorist Marshall McLuhan as its quote-unquote uh, patron saint. Makes sense. I, uh, I think we talked about in a previous episode, I had studied Marshall McLuhan um, uh, and influence on media when I was in graduate school. So at, I never would have put it together, but you're right. Fits right in with the Wired ethos. Wired went on to chronicle the evolution of digital technology and its impact on society, quickly becoming recognized as the voice of the emerging digital economy and culture and a pace setter in print design and web design. Yeah, yeah. And during its explosive growth in the mid-90s, it articulated the values of a far-reaching, quote-unquote, digital revolution, driven by the people creating and using digital technology and networks. So as we talked about, this was becoming accessible to more people. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, so uh, Wired didn't do beach culture numbers, Todd, but it won three National Magazine Awards in its first five years two for general excellence and one for design. Yeah, nice. And Good Magazine places Early Wired among the top 10 best magazines ever. Um, so not a bad accolade to have. Yeah. And yeah, Adweek yeah. acknowledged Wired as its magazine of the decade in 2009. And, wow, um, okay. Yeah, and SFGate called Wired the magazine that led the digital revolution. 
I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they made it into a thing uh, when it was uh, up until then. Um, tech was back room stuff. It was a uh, it was a uh, IT. So uh, it really was a revolution then. And as we mentioned in some of our recent uh, Patreon content, uh, as a side note, I hung out at Wired when it was only a year old uh, in the summer of 94. Um, got to meet a lot of wonderful people. And there's, there was so much fun and, and so much talent, just smart people. Um, it was really an amazing time. Yeah, like, like us, smart, talented people. And speaking of amazing times, don't you think it's about time for another round? Yeah, you're right. It is. Why are you staring off into the distance like that, Elliot? Huh? Oh, uh, I was just daydreaming about when you return with some uh, amazing cocktails uh, for us. Here, here we go again. Here we go again. All right. Okay. All right. Give us a few minutes. We'll be right back. Hi, we want to take a moment to mention that if you're enjoying this episode, we have an archive of topics ranging from the Olympics to movie posters. Think Ghostbusters. Iconic images. Think Bigfoot. Punk music. The Ramones. Saturday morning cartoons. The Pink Panther. And failed products like OK Soda. Visit our website at twodesignerswalkintoabar.com for full episode notes and visuals the latest blog content, and to sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on social media. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Find the links on our website or search using the phrase two designers walk into a bar. Most importantly, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people like you find podcasts like this. And tell a friend about us. Send them a link to our podcast from your listening platform of choice. And, if you're inclined, buy our merchandise. Stickers, coasters, magnets, t-shirts. We're designers. We make good stuff, and it helps support the show. Get in touch. Use the contact form on our website, or send an email to hello at twodesignerswalkintoabar.com. We read every message we get. Honest. And we're available for speaking gigs. Email us to learn more. Okay, now, back to the bar. Todd, thanks for the round of cocktails. Uh, as mm -hmm. I always like to say with both our bar tab and this podcast, I couldn't do it without you. Oh, God, please. Please, please. <laughs> uh. yeah, okay, <laughs> you saw through that. I'm just buttering you up. But it's as good a lead-in as any. You mentioned you've brought a magazine to the bar as well. So yes, uh, enough of you... my gum flapping. What do you have for us? <laughs> well, you can't talk about the heyday of magazines, my young friend, without recognizing Rolling Stone for both their journalistic bite as well as the way the content was presented. Am I right? Is it bold? Yes. Was it inventive? Yeah, not David Carson inventive, but it was inventive. And it was captivating, too. Um, and everyone knows Rolling Stone mm -hmm. now. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it, it did not start off as mainstream, but in that particular era, uh, in the 90s, it was growing tremendously and it became a platform for emerging artists, illustrators, photographers. I was addicted to that like you were <laughs> Reagan Magazine. It taught okay. me so much. Yeah. It was a lesson in layout, content, illustration, every episode. And the man behind all of that, there was a, there was a guy that uh, has come from a history of magazines i'll tell you a little bit more about in a second but his name was fred woodward yes and he, he's been such an incredible force in the field of design and art direction and you might ask why is that well similar like david carson he challenged what a magazine layout could be 
<laughs> Did he also set articles in Zafting Bats? I don't think he would do that. Oh, I don't think okay. he would do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think his publisher stopped that. I think John <laughs> Leonard stopped that. But, Higher standards. Uh, okay. Yeah, but both of them made us look at magazine pages and take it in. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just. Um, it wasn't just for reading anymore. It was absorbing all yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, and not quite like David Carson. Fred Woodward's work was was more and more elegant, maybe a little more conceptual, a little mm-hmm. more varied in tone too. Um, and probably, I you know, doing a little thinking about this, probably because it was varied because he brought a lot of different experiences to the job before he was at Rolling Stone. His first duty as art director was with uh, Memphis Magazine. He then moved to D Magazine, and that D means Dallas. Oh, right? okay. Before you let your mind wander. <laughs> Big D, Dallas. <laughs> Westward, which was you know the Dallas Times Herald. Ah. Uh, Texas Monthly, which uh, he started making a name for himself there. Um, pretty well regarded. And then moved to Regardies in Washington, D.C. So... Lots of variety of topics to get curious about. Kind of sounds like us a little bit, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we should uh, invite uh, Fred to the bar at some point. I would love that. Fred, if you're listening, give us a jingle, buddy. And if uh, friends of Fred are listening, pass this episode along to Fred. Yeah, well, and also David Carson, if, uh, if, you, if you got a minute, you know, let's talk collages, man. That's right. And so speaking of varied, his educational background was pretty varied, too. Before his career, uh, he majored in journalism, physical education, political science, all at Mississippi State University. Because why wouldn't you major in all three of those? <laughs> so right? he was almost a gym teacher is what you're saying? Uh, a gym teacher, politician, uh, writer, journalist, yeah. Oh, okay. He's a uh, Swiss Mrs. Army knife of designers. <laughs> he was, yeah, yeah. Damn. He moved to Memphis State University and finally settled on graphic design, for which I'm very happy that he did. You and me both. Yeah. But getting back to his tenure at Rolling Stone, uh, he began as an art director there in 1987. And uh, his leadership there spanned some 14 years and almost 400 issues. And... You, you got to think about like the the issues that he did. There were it was it was covers, it was features, it was like all these different parts and pieces to it. And in each one of those bits, what he brought to it was this kind of playfulness and this inventive quality of his layouts and and typography. And it had a pretty significant influence on the the industry during the '90s. We're going to post a couple uh, examples of some of my favorite layouts from Rolling Stone. There could be hundreds there. Yeah, so oh, easily, we won't, easily. We yeah. won't bore people, but let me tell you, can I tell you just about three of them that were my favorites for different reasons? Please um, do. Yeah, we'll see if they uh, cross over, because when you say Fred Woodward and Rolling Stone, there are some layouts that are in my head as well, probably oh, because yeah. you and I were brought up in the same diet of design annuals and everything like that. So we've seen these over and over and over again. Yep, iconic. Well, the first one was um, around the period, I guess it was the second Tim Burton Batman movie that had Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman. I mean... I'm that sounds sure, right. Sure. Yeah. It wasn't the first one. I know after Prince and Batman Party Company, you tuned it out. <laughs> I did. It, it was, it, yeah, it was dead to me then. But uh, during that time, they did a profile of Michelle Pfeiffer. Mm-hmm. And the title of it was The Bats Meow. Get it? Instead of the Cats Meow. Yes. The Bats Meow. And what's kind of clever here is the word meow is laid out to look like a cat's ears, nose, mouth, and legs using the M, the E, the O, and the W. It's elegant and it's playful and it's still very readable too. Complementing that on the left side of the spread is just a full page image shot by Herb Ritz of the beautiful Michelle Pfeiffer. Um, So simple, elegant, playful, and fun. Now another one that has some of the same qualities was from August 22nd, 1991 issue of Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's a lead in to the story and it reads, I'm quoting, men are in crisis, whereas he is not. He does not know the meaning of crisis, or perhaps he does, but he pretends otherwise. He is Austrian after all, and some. 
And the title of the article <laughs> about Arnold is Mr. Big Shot. And it bounces across the whole spread, the whole two pages, um, these giant letters that say Mr. Big Shot. And the O of shot is formed by a photograph of a giant inflatable inner tube in which Arnold is sitting right in the middle of, and he's on a beach. Again, happens to be a photo by Herb Ritz. It's a black and white. It's beautifully toned. It's, and the whole thing is fun and it's playful. It's unexpected, and it's really tasteful. Yeah, yeah. So we'll put this on our episode page. The inner tube is propped up vertically. Right, So he's right, sit, right. almost like a tire swing kind of thing, and he's sitting inside of it. Right, right. And I want to mention also that um, if you were to pick up an issue of Rolling Stone today, just like Wired, it's smaller than it used to be. You know, oh, yeah, Rolling Stone yeah. used to be much bigger. I don't know if it was quite the... Um, ratio or size of a record album but it was much closer to that during the time we're talking about the reason i bring that up a lot of these spreads were really like mini posters yeah they were they had a lot of real estate to work with and um that means they were displaying the work of these artists and illustrators and photographers bold and big and uh just extra captivating so good point thank you for that the last one I want to mention is is one of my favorite. There's plenty of Rolling Stone covers that are just brilliant. Because if you think about, as you said in the beginning, the top of the episode, they kind of have to jump off the shelf, don't yeah, they? They, yeah. they sort of are the calling card for this. So they're putting a whole lot of content into sort of one um, surface there. Yeah, all of the cover teasers, right? Because you sort of right, have the, lead, right. the head article, the main article, but then you also have these secondary articles that, hey, yep. you might not be an Arnold Schwarzenegger, but you, I don't know, might be into Metallica, so you still might pick it up. Right, so all of that has to work together on a cover, right? While well, you've got a hero and then these other things. And just to show what a stickler for details Fred was. Um, This is a Jimi Hendrix cover that I love. It's from February 6th, 1992. And it was for the issue about the greatest guitarists of all time. The photographic portrait of Hendrix, it's all blue tints. It's very rich. It's it's super moody. Uh, It's gorgeous. He's staring directly at the camera holding a cigarette, I think it's a cigarette, and uh, on his right and left, he's surrounded by the feature copy, so pretty simple, pretty bold, and Hendrix's head violates the Rolling Stone logo. This is the part that I love, because his head happens to be blocking out the letters, except for the ones that spell Roll One. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) I absolutely love that so so much. That's so great. So here he is, smoking something on, you know, this mainstream magazine uh, when cannabis wasn't legal anywhere in the United States and and big as life on the cover it says roll one so I think, <laughs> I, uh, there you go there you go Fred <laughs> that was uh, a little Easter egg yeah and you know speaking of awards like you mentioned before with um, with wired and with Ray gun uh, Rolling Stone won more international design awards than any other magazine uh, in the United States, uh, including, I'm a, I'm a nerd out here a little bit, Okay, the National me. Magazine Awards General Excellence Prize, which you mentioned before. Yep. Uh, in 1990, the magazine received a total of 17 gold and silver medals from the prestigious Art Directors Club of New York, uh, the most awarded to a single recipient in the club's history. So kind of a big deal. And Society of Publication Designers awarded him the first ever Best in Show honor in 1995. Wow, okay. And following that run in 1996, Woodward was the youngest ever to be inducted into the Art Directors Hall of Fame at the age of 44 so come on that's not that young right no but no i it guess isn't. i guess i guess you had to work your butt off for a long long time before you could get in there and, <laughs> that's uh, right you know you had to be in your 60s a couple others you know little minor things that you know you probably 
uh, would blink and miss. He received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Type Directors Club, and in 2004, uh, he was given the prestigious AIGA Medal for Design Legends. So not shabby, my oh, friend. You know, right? th- uh, this reminds me, we're still waiting for our call from AIGA. So I, oh, we're assuming right. that AIGA, you've just lost our phone number. We're happy to give yeah. that out again. Right, and... Uh, uh, and our email address, and as, along with um, David and Fred, give us a jingle, AIGA. <laughs> We'd love to hear from we'll you. We'll buy the first. Well, Todd will uh, pick up the first round. All right. We won't quibble over, over that right this second. But um, let me just wrap up this part um, in talking about Rolling Stone by, by also saying that he edited and designed the illustrated portraits of Rolling Stone in uh, 1999, which is a collection of their best paintings, caricatures, drawings that were included in the pages of the magazine. As I said, they work with a lot of artists and illustrators and a lot of emerging artists and illustrators. And along with the emerging ones, a lot of luminaries uh, that I got to study and know well in my early career, such as Ralph Steadman, Anita Kuntz, one of my favorites, Milton, uh, uh, last name, uh, Glaser, Milton Glaser. Anyone heard of him? I, I, I may have a passing. He, he did something with Bob Dylan, didn't he? He did. I, I think he played tambourine on Mr. That's tambourine. That's what it was. Was that it? That, was yeah, that it? yeah. He, okay. he was, he was the anyway. roadie for Bob Dylan. I think. That's right. Well, look him up, kids. Not to mention others like you. You talked about Matt Mahiran, who is one of my favorites. Yeah. Philip Burke, and just. Hundreds others. Yeah, and just to again contextualize this a little bit, there is always the table of contents, and then right next to the table of contents in the spread, there would always be an amazing illustration to help yeah, you yeah. want to engage with the whole magazine. I can't think of '90s era Fred Woodward era Rolling Stone without thinking of Philip Burke. Yeah, 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 yeah. His illustrations are so iconic from that time yeah, period. Definitely. And, you know, I'll wrap up by saying the role of the art director is to bring us into the content, right? It's to, it's to conceptually tell us what the content is about at a glance without even reading a word. Um, it's to get us intrigued. It's to get us to, to push along in the story. And I, I, as a subscriber at the time, um, I would say that Fred really made me read the content, and that helped me understand the world better. And not just the art world and the design world, um, but the world world, capital W world, that uh, the journalists were writing about. Uh, in 2001, he left Rolling Stone for GQ, and he was there for 16 years. And as far as we know, I don't know that he's working for a current magazine, but um, Fred, again, if you're out there, give us a jingle. So, Todd, one thing I want to bring up, you mentioned something that um, I hadn't mentioned up to this point that I think is so insightful, and that is great editorial design. You will Mm -hmm, read mm -hmm. or engage with content you probably otherwise Mm -hmm. wouldn't engage with because the design is so good. Mm -hmm. The layout is interesting. There's a great illustration or a great photograph. And I do think that's something that's sort of lost when you have things posted online. There's something about encountering the delight and surprise of that when you're flipping through a magazine i think yeah it felt more uh, the word that keeps popping in my head is elegant and that's probably not the the truest word but things were paced out yes you know there was yeah it was interactive oddly enough to say about you know a paper thing but it, you turned pages uh, and they paced it so it was there was a big thing. There was, uh, it was like a movie, basically. Mm-hmm. There were these giant opening scenes, and then you got into details, and then it would skip to page 200 to, you know, see the last bit of it. But <laughs> advertisers love that, though, because it forced you to flip through the magazine. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and you know, which is what a great art director uh, does. So you reminded me of a story that I'll tell very, very quickly. Um, okay. When I was in college, I wanted desperately to be an art director of a magazine. I I still wouldn't mind it. So if there are any magazines out there and you want to give us a call, (laughs) go for it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But um, I was pretty obsessed, as you mentioned, with magazines like Wired, Raygun. And 
Rolling Stone. I was also picking it up off the newsstand basically every month. I probably should have subscribed, but I was ignoring those blow-in cards. <laughs> so I was paying a <laughs> sticker price, I guess you could say. So I had the privilege to meet Fred Woodward in an event, uh, a, a professional design event, when I was in college. And uh, I basically uh, shamelessly hit him up for an internship at Rolling Stone. And um, so he was very kind, um, uh, one of the nicest men I've ever met, one of the nicest designers. And um, I gave him a business card, gave him a way to contact me, and he actually did call uh, a few times. Um, but what I'd forgotten about <laughs> was uh, at the time there really wasn't voicemail. We had old answering machines uh, in mm -hmm. dorm rooms mm -hmm. that had, you know, the cassette tape in it. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'd forgotten about uh, when I gave him my card was that my college roommate and I actually didn't have any sort of outgoing message on the machine. It was just <laughs> what we had recorded was 30 seconds of uh, of um, an Irish drinking music, uh, like folk music cassette he had. So we just had 30 <laughs> seconds of Irish drinking music. So I remember I came home one day from class and, you know, the lights blinking on the answering machine and I play the message back and it was Fred Woodward just laughing. <laughs> and, he, and, and he was like, oh my God. He's like, is this Irish drinking music? This is one of the funniest things ever. He's like, hey, uh, this is a message for Elliot. This is uh, Fred Woodward at Rolling Stone. If you could give me a call back. <laughs> and he's just like, <laughs> so it was a very, again, super nice man. Obviously had a very good sense of humor. <laughs> and I, I don't know, maybe um, I, I added a little bit of a, a delight to his work day that day with our, with our Irish drinking music. So It sounds like it. Yeah, it but it, like it didn't it. ultimately end up with uh, an internship at Rolling Stone. So I guess uh, ah. clever outgoing messages only get you so far in the professional world. Well, it, yeah. I mean, who knows? We could be sitting here talking about uh, the the Rolling Stone era with Elliot Strunk. Of course, I don't know if I'd be talking to you about it. I'd be talking to somebody else about it. I mean, I used to know Elliot. You know what? You could talk. I would, Todd, I would still talk to you. Okay. All right. Well, then I could interview you about how famous you were at Rolling Stone working with Fred Woodward, couldn't I? How about we uh, shift gears and talk about another magazine as we wrap up? All right, let's do that. Okay, so uh, as long as we are talking music magazines, let's talk about one more that was very influential during this time, and that was Vibe magazine. Do you remember Vibe? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hadn't thought about that in years. Yeah, so let's yeah. talk about it during the era of Gary Kopke. So he was the original art director. So let's back up a step here for a moment. So people may have heard of Vibe. Um, older listeners probably remember it, probably subscribed to it, read it, whatever. So it was published in print from 1993 to 2014. So it had a pretty good run, right? So 21 yeah, years, yeah, yeah. you know, it's nothing to sneeze at, right? But uh, now it still exists, but it's it's an online publication and it sort of has these um, what I'll refer to as quote unquote uh, digital covers and mm -hmm. and other graphics, but it's really not the same as as when it was printed. Mm -hmm. But even as late as the early '90s, uh, the jury was still out on whether hip hop would receive full mainstream acceptance. It's crazy mm -hmm. to think about now, of course, as we're sitting here twenty odd years later. But this was an issue. And as much as the more quote-unquote street-solidified artists hate to admit it, the record-breaking sales and global appeal of crossover artists like MC Hammer and mm. controversial groups like NWA really helped to broaden rap's audience, right? Definitely, yeah. So you sort of had the radio-friendly, MTV-friendly kind of semi-goofball artists on one side, and then you had the total... Um, hardcore <laughs> artists right, on the right. other side that were, and, you know, taking chrome off a trailer hitch whenever you played their music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, what an amazing spectrum of, of artists there. I remember I, I, I didn't pick up Vibe a lot, but when I did, what I remember about it was just that, how varied the, uh, the content was, all different types of artists. So it was... Were there other magazines around at the time that were like that? Sort of. So there were magazines like The Source, but they were smaller and they were really more newsletter-like. They weren't true commercial products mm -hmm. that were glossy mm -hmm. 
and um, for mainstream brands and record labels to advertise in. So this was really breaking new ground. This was an untapped business opportunity. Mm. And Vibe was started by multi-hyphenate entertainment industry mogul Quincy Jones. You've probably heard, heard of him. him. Yeah. Heard yeah. of him. He's yeah. done a thing or two. He did a thing, yeah. And Time Incorporated of Time Magazine fame. Oh, I think they did something, too. Yeah, yeah, you may have heard of them. Um, So they worked together to elevate the visual approach and general narrative of hip-hop culture, essentially. So, again, you guys are going to find that this is a common theme, listeners. It was oversize. Um, It was, you know, a bigger magazine. And the design was very clean when compared to a lot of the visuals happening in hip-hop at the time that were really Mm -hmm. overly photoshopped. Everything was beveled. Everything was reflective. Everything had diamonds on it. You know, it was iced out, you know, to use uh, current language, right? So it was very busy. It was still kind of like amateurish, a lot of it. It was very all over the map. And full disclosure here, um, I actually helped contribute to that while working for a a West Coast-based hip-hop magazine while I was in college. So we have you to thank for icing out everything. Did you create Iced Out, the font? Is that what it was? No, I, I didn't do that. I will admit there was, I think, some use of Kai's power tools from time to time. If people oh, remember that I, Photoshop I, plugin, I haven't heard that in forever. Yeah, either. yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. digging in the crates, Todd. Telling there you. you go. I know. Look at you. Like you could bring that back. It'd be total retro yeah, now. I, I could. Yeah. Hold on. Um, I got. I got something to do. Can you just finish this episode? Yeah. yeah I'll just. I'll just keep going here. <laughs> uh, I'll wait for you. <laughs> <laughs> so the original look and feel was developed by. The founding creative director, Gary Kopke, who I mentioned earlier, and he later went on to found uh, Modernista, which is a Boston ad shop. You've probably heard of them, right? Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. So they were famous for, among other things, dropping music from obscure artists into mainstream TV spots they produced for clients like The Gap, MTV, Napster, and Converse. Oh, okay. Um, Hmm. The very 90s. Uh, So they broke bands and then uh, the hearts of their biggest fans, right? (laughs) Yeah, it was the one-two punch. (laughs) But it struck a balance between feeling polished and and feeling authentic, you know, this magazine. So it it had a foot in each camp for sure, right? It had to, again, be mainstream and and, uh, polished enough that average newsstand stores places would want to carry it so it had the distribution so they could charge more to advertisers and so more people could find it so the circulation would increase so you could charge even more to advertisers <laughs> oh okay yeah okay. that's that's how magazines work i know you're new oh, to this whole idea now now i'm understanding yeah, yeah now now that the internet's taking over everything you're just becoming acquainted with the business model i think i want to launch a giant 13 by 13 magazine now you because should of that. you should I'll help you with it. It'll only have two issues, but it'll win a lot of design awards. <laughs> <laughs> so Vibe launched in 1993 in the East Village of New York City with a party at the nightclub and concert venue Webster Hall. All right. And the first issue had Snoop Dogg on the front cover with the headline, Bow Wow Wow. <laughs> uh, the Dog Father. Yeah. D-O double G. Yeah. Yeah. Love Snoop. So we'll put that cover on our website. He's gone on to do a thing or two since uh, 1993 as well. Hasn't yeah. He? Was, yeah. He became friends with Martha Stewart. And uh, yeah. And he's a commentator on um, on TV shows. And uh, yeah, he's he's kicking it. I, I, I'd love to hang out with Snoop. Oh, yeah. He? He'd be a blast. Yeah. So Snoop, Fred, David Carson, we're all going to party together. Yep, give us a jingle. <laughs> so um, additional Vibe cover subjects over the years included Ice Cube, Prince, your friend, yep. and of course, Tupac. Oh, yeah. And using great design, photography, and writing, I think we're going to find that this is the, the motif through this whole episode, Vibe was a staple for youth culture in the 90s and into the early aughts. All right, Todd. So we brought a bunch of magazines uh, to the bar. Yep. Um, I'm kind of sad we have to pack these up again. Maybe we'll we'll leave them here for the other bar patrons to enjoy. So how did we do? So we had our criteria. So let's go back and, and revisit. Yeah. I would say in all of these cases, the work popped off the rack. Could we agree about that? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Okay, and then the second thing we mentioned: the work won awards for being unique and also true to the material. Right? It wasn't yeah. eye candy for eye candy's sake. Yeah. It was actually enhancing the subject matter. 
Yeah, 100%. And and as we said a few minutes ago, made us get into the content. Yeah, abs- and inspire. I mean, I think you and I were both like really, just like Matt, as we've talked about before with all the illustrations right. and Matt. I mean, great work just inspires more creativity. Um, it's sort right, of this flywheel right. effect. Um, right. And as a result of that, <laughs> their work spawned countless imitators. And I would say that some were more successful than others, as we've talked about. Yeah, I, w- I think I would agree with you on that. Man, Elliot, you're making me miss uh, those days of, of getting magazines in the mail and, and kind of hanging out and flipping through them, trading them with your friends. And all this talk about magazines is making me nostalgic for all the fun beer and liquor ads that they used to have. Oh, yeah. Things like Tangeray, Goldschlager. Whoa, you mean like both in the same drink? Huh, Todd, you're such an innovator. Yes. And grab what? one for yourself as well. You oh, know, and we uh, throw in a twist of lemon. <sighs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw in a twist of lemon, all right. Don't, <laughs> don't you worry about that. Oh, man. You know what? Right, Alcohol well. kills a lot of things, so uh, I'm not scared. <laughs> oh, Thanks for talking about magazines today, Elliot, and uh, everyone, uh, all of our listeners out there, hope you enjoyed. Stay tuned for the next episode coming up in a couple weeks. Yep, we're going to shift gears. We're going to end our journey into Gen X for now, and we appreciate all of you hanging out with us for this uh, series of episodes, and we hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Yep. Yep.